Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Mitchell Cohen is a proud member of the Haverford College of 1980. It's his pleasure to bring this special event to you. He is, has spearheaded this evening, and we are very grateful to him. Tonight, we will be learning about Clark Hewlings, an impressive member of the class of 1945, and an artist who, the, although a major in physics, pursued a career as a painter. Uh, Mitchell says he doesn't know anything about Clark Hewlings or his work, or he didn't previously, but he was lucky enough to discover him in his later years, and Mitchell wanted to share that discovery with other people and the Haverford community, and this event is for you. We're very lucky to have with us tonight Mr. Hewling's daughter, Ms. Elizabeth Hewlings, who along with her mother established the Clark Hewlings Fund for Visual Artists as a way of extending his example and achievements during his lifetime. Elizabeth is the Clark Hewlings Fund Executive Director and as you will hear, she, the fund provides training for visual artists not to become better at their craft, but to become better at the business of art so they can both follow their passion and put food on the table. Also, we have with us Jack Morris Jr advisory board member and curator of Mr. Hewling's estate, who will give us an overview of Mr. Hewling's artistic legacy and place in the world of American artists. In addition, we will hear from Mr. James D. Balistrieri, a respected arts writer. Lastly, our moderator this evening will be me. I am Penelope Thomas. I am the Director of Communications and Partnerships at the Clark Hewling's Fund. Um, all these bios are on the slide that you're seeing now and on our websites. We'd all like to thank the wonderful Ms. Kat Toya, the Associate Director of Alumni and Parent Relations at Haverford. We would not be able to do this without her. Thank you so much, Kat. So we are going to launch into a little th three section part of the evening. I'm gonna start with asking Elizabeth a few questions. Then we'll talk to gallerist Jack Morris and then we will talk to Jim Balistrieri. So let's kick this off with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, can you start us off at the beginning and tell us about how your father became an artist? Well, those members of his family who are on this call would tell you that um, he was just born that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, when he was six years old, he came home from first grade with a, well, you know, now that he's an artist, we would say it's pastel, but you know, Crayola crayon portrait of his stepmother, Elena, and he brought it home, put it on the table and everybody knew it was her because he caught her likeness. And I think everybody in that moment went, uh oh, we have an artist on our hands. Um, so, I mean, he always, always wanted to pursue that. You know, when he was 12 years old, he got a really bad cold and somebody gave him a, a set of oil paints to cheer him up and, uh, he started using them. He would take them to the Met Museum when his father made him go to visit his aunt, Aunt Mabel, in the city. He'd let him go to the Met instead of having to hang out with them. And he just started copying all the paintings at the Met. Uh, and again, he'd come home with a piece of paper that he'd, co you know, he'd copied a sergeant portrait or, you know, Del El Greco or whatever. And everybody said, oh, that's El Greco. <laughs> so it was pretty clear. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So we could skip ahead to how, how did Hewlings end up at Haverford as an artist? How did that happen? That's another good question. Um, uh, he didn't want to go to college, um, but it was during World War II and he'd had TB, so he was 4F, couldn't be in the army. And his father was kind of jointly concerned that he would starve as an artist and uh, <laughs> he felt that he needed to do something for the war effort so he went to college and he made a major in physics and uh, i mean he made it all the way through it went three years so he was you know decent at it but he never he used to say you know it was fun when you were learning about how radios worked and sound going around corners and stuff but pretty quickly it it evolves or devolves into just high level math and, and he didn't want to do that. So, um, but, but even though he went through in three years and he was sick and it was, you know, by the time, by the time he graduated, which was actually in 1944. And I learned from Mitchell that they called the class of 45, the, the half years or 44 and a half or something. Um, 
there were only seven people who graduated with him. So even though it was a hard time and he, he didn't like physics, he loved Haverford and he really appreciated the, um, the Quaker kind of sensibility of it. Mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, growing up with him, I got that. I got a lot of that. You know, goodness is its own reward. Um, you don't have to make big statements about everything or be seen to be spiritual or anything. You can just kind of quietly be that way. And I think he was, he really took that to heart and he, he did that for his whole life. He, he, and he tried to pass it on to me, whether he did or not, I don't know, but he tried. <laughs> yeah. So what's the story of how he went on to pick up the artistic thread again after the physics degree at Haverford? Um, he, when he finished at Haverford, he had an appointment to work in the Manhattan Project and he went out to New Mexico and fell in love with it immediately because it reminded him of Spain and he just loved it. He had lived in Spain when he was little and um, he went up to Los Alamos and they said, well, we can't let you in, you're sick. And once you get in, you're not getting out. You know, you can't go to the doctor and have them give you medicine and then you give away our secrets or something. So you can't come. So he went back down the hill to Santa Fe and called his parents and his father said, well, don't come here because here by then was Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is like, if you have TB, don't go there. That's the worst place to go. He said, you're already in the best place to be in the dry desert Southwest, stay there. So he did. And he started supporting himself by painting pastels of children and pastels in general. And when we were all kind of vamping and waiting, you know, Marcus and Jack, you were talking and Marcus, you said that, that Mike has a, a pastel of like 1944, that would be from that time. So he immediately started that and he ended up in Denver working in a physics lab because he had to earn a living. And then he ended up taking what uh, he had been working on in Denver, managed to get back to Baton Rouge about a year later and he started painting portraits. And we actually have some of these if you want to show any of it, Penelope, if you want to Yeah, show. let's do that. Um, those are of me. I mean, when you're the daughter of an artist, you get to be, yeah. So if you look at that one all the way on the left, that is my grandfather, Cortland Hughlings. And he painted that in about 1946, 47. And um, when my aunt was getting married to the man on the bottom right, that's my uncle Harry, the um, press came out to interview her and they decided to take pictures of her on the mantle, you know, for the society, page six, Baton Rouge Register. And the, the press looked up and saw that painting and said, wait a minute, what's that? That's you who did that. And they said, he's in my son. And pretty soon they wrote this, you know, little article about Sue Ottinger getting married. And then they wrote a three page article about Clark Hewling's the fabulous portrait painter and he launched a big career from that painting portraits so after that it was like yeah I guess I guess you can quit the job in the physics lab because you're supporting yourself and you're famous in the paper so well that that's a good segue Elizabeth for just actually bringing up the issue of supporting yourself as an artist and like one one example among many about how Clark was strategic in that way that's true that's yeah. true um, and, and yeah, that is, you know, the reason that here I sit today dedicated to helping other artists be successful the way he was, right? Because he wasn't afraid of, of business and he wasn't afraid of negotiating and he didn't have a problem with balancing market and muse and making his way forward, right? So that's exactly right. Um, he found portraiture to be very taxing because you could spend six weeks, you know, with um, Miss Singletary in the blue dress there. And at the end of it, they have the unveiling in the parlor with the whole family and the interior decorator. And they unveil the painting, look at it and say, that's lovely, except that blue does not harmonize with our living room. <laughs> so can you paint the dress a different color? And he's like, well, um, are you gonna pay me more to paint the dress a different color? I mean, it's, you know, cause nobody else wants that painting. Only people who know that woman are gonna be interested in that painting. Portraits are hard. 
-hmm. So he realized he was, you know, it was interesting, it was fun, he was good at it, but um, it wasn't really the kind of artist he wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, as he sort of started to transition out of that, he spent some years as a commercial illustrator as well, right? Well, what he did was he went to New York and he started studying at the Art Students League. He'd studied there when he was a kid, um, brokered a different kind of deal with his father when he was homesick with TV that he could go in and study with George Bridgman in New York as long as he spent the whole morning in bed. So he went as soon as he could, he saved up money and talked him into it immediately back to New York to the Art Students League. And he did that for three years, studied under Frank Riley, who for those who, who know was like the guru, right? Um, and he came out in 1948 and yeah, he went into commercial illustration. Um, <laughs> he started um, like doing the, the wash drawings of turkeys in the paper, you know, that kind of thing and you make a buck. Um, but he slowly worked his way up and he did, I mean, here, here are several. He did something like 300 different book covers and he did LP covers and he was in high demand. He used to say he was in high demand mostly because he actually lived in the city, whereas a lot of the illustrators lived out on Long Island or in Westchester, they live in the suburbs. And it was harder for them to make it to the office real quick when they had an urgent rush job, whereas they could call him he go down there at four o'clock, pick up the book, read it, stay up all night and produce something to take back down to them at 9 a.m. And so they liked that. And so they would use them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, back to the work ethic and, and business side of things, he would get home at 9 a.m. and crash after doing that. And his father would call him at 9, 10 in the morning and say, aren't you up? it's light outside, <laughs> you know, when it's light outside, we work. And he's like, I just was up all night, you know? Right. So yeah, not the yeah. stereotype of the, of the freewheeling chilled out artist. Yeah. yeah. They never reconciled that, never reconciled that. Um, but anyway, so, so he was in high demand as an illustrator and it was a great time to be an illustrator. I mean, that was the heyday, you know, in the, in the fifties. Um, and I know Penelope, you should show them the, the next slide that we have there. Sure, yeah. Um, his illustration has is, is, had a major comeback lately, right? Um, it went out. The illustration <laughs> kind of slowly faded because uh, graphic design came in, computers came in, and you didn't have to hire an artist to do a full painting in order to have a book. But now, I mean, this is hot. So maybe tell them, tell them about this and I'll be honest, turn it back on you. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I ran into Barry Silver's work on Instagram where he's creating a series of fake pulp novel covers as political satire. And when I saw the swing state cover that you're looking at here, I looked at that chair and I'm like, I know there's a Hewlings cover with the same chair. And, I, and if you, you can see the stylistic similarities between them, the composition of that, the triangles of the chair where, where the text is laid out, which Elizabeth tells me that Clark used to mock into his illustrations as well. So just in case you think this kind of illustration is dead, we're still doing it. So what I wanted to ask Elizabeth to start to, I mean, we haven't quite got into his easel painting era seriously yet, which we will with Jack and Jim as well, but, um, even before we've touched on the major contributions of his work artistically, I'd love to hear more about what you feel his legacy is. So if we have Haverford painters on the line with us tonight, like what does he have to teach that this new group of artists, both creatively and about the business side? Um, I know that Jack will probably have something to say about that in terms of, but you know, back to Haverford and what he, what he learned at Haverford, not in physics, but how to live your life. Right. Um, you know, from his father, he learned you're supposed to be awake and you have to have a, a strong work ethic and, and, and all of that. And I think that is a serious piece of his legacy. Right. I mean, he loved to paint donkeys. And if you scroll back up on the slides, you'll see um, you'll see an example. Um, and he loved to paint donkeys because they're uh, they're 
workhorses, excuse the pun, but you know, they're quotidian, they're not fancy, they're not beautiful and elegant, but they are loyal, they are steadfast, they can carry more weight than any other animal pound per pound. They will work like a dog. Donkeys work like dogs and Hewlings work like a donkey. And he just did that for his whole life. He showed up and, you know, at, at the Clark Hewlings Fund, where we try to teach artists how to follow in his footsteps on the business side, most of what we talk about is the difference between professionals and amateurs is professionals show up. They don't give up. They just put in the work every day, whatever that is. And, and that's true no matter what your career is. And that was, he did that when he had to work in the physics lab. He did that as a portraitist. He did that as an illustrator. He did that on his own in his easel painting career. Um, so I think it's determination and hard work and um, taking yourself as seriously as you take anybody else, but always remembering that you're probably not the smartest person in the room. And even if you are, there's something to be learned from every single person in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that humility. And I think that, I think a lot of that came from Haverford. I see that as a, as a trait that the college seeks to instill or cultivate in their students. Yeah. So to any budding artists out there at Haverford or on this call, I would say, you, you've already got what you need to succeed, right? Because the other thing he would always say is, um, you'd rather have 5% talent, 95% drive. Because it's the drive that gets you there, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we only have a couple of minutes for this, but could you do a little segue into how that translates into what we're doing at the Clark Hewlings Fund, what we're offering and why? Sure, and we have a slide at the end that we can talk about too. Yep. Um, so what do we do? We teach artists business. Um, we have a, a digital campus with, I think it's like maybe up to 80 courses now in every functional area of a business. Um, there it is. We have, uh, we just finished doing a major live virtual conference that spanned two weeks and we had people, I just saw the data that you sent today, Penelope, we had people from every state and how many countries uh, attend that virtual conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we start with, you know, career blueprint. What are you trying to achieve? How do you achieve it? Um, why are you doing what you're doing? And we move into sales and marketing and branding and I mean, every functional area of a business. So we're, we're talking to Wells Fargo now about their hands-on banking so that we can deliver a whole bunch of curriculum from, from that area. Um, and the goal is to uh, make sure that today's artists and creative professionals more generally, um, know that they, they can succeed and get their message across and feed themselves doing it if they are willing to put in the work and they're smart about it and they, they're they determined and they're willing to get the skills and tools that they need in order to accomplish those things. Um, and the reason is because art matters. Art matters more at this moment than ever, you know? I mean, yep. we, we have a lot of work to do on this planet if we're gonna survive on this planet and continue to move forward um, in, a, in a sustainable functioning way. And the people with the ideas are the ones we have to follow. So it behooves us to infuse as much creativity throughout our entire society as we possibly can yep. in order to um, show up and coming people that they can be creative and they, you never know when an idea is gonna spring, you know, bring another idea and creativity begets creativity. So that's my, uh, I'll get off the, the soapbox, but that's the reason I do what I do. Yeah. And that's the reason the CHF exists. Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason my father was, you know, this peripatetic traveler all over the world um, with a 60 plus year career in, in 
visual art. He had something to tell us and he was determined to do so. And we wanna make sure that people working today have the same tools and capabilities, but also belief. Yeah. 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 Nice. Thank you, Elizabeth. And we'll be, when we close this talk today, we'll be giving some URLs and contact information to find out more about what we do at the Clark Hewlings Fund and how to get involved. So thank you so much, Elizabeth.